Good morning. My name is Lakshmi Rao. I'm a director with the International District Energy Association, and it is my pleasure to have you join us for this workshop today. The content and discussion will be based on a research report that IDEA produced for uh, produced in April of 2017, so it's very recent for the International Energy Agency um, implementing agreement on uh, uh, district heating, cooling, uh, and CHP. It was part of Annex 11. That's how they do their research uh, reports. So I would like to thank them very much for supporting this important work and for enabling this workshop. Um, I look forward to your engagement and a rich discussion. We have a lot of experts in the room and we'd like to build on the work we have done. So I want to very quickly show you the report because today's workshop is just going to touch on the highlights of this report, which is very comprehensive. And uh, it's available on the IDA website. It's also available on the IEA website. And uh, it's a report that covers select countries, um, Canada, where Bruce Ander hails from, uh, South Korea, Jong Jun Lee, uh, Michael King from the UK, and Anna Chittam uh, has put in content for Denmark, and uh, we worked on the USA. So it's a select bunch of countries that we have showcased in this report, and it's, it's very focused on governance models and strategic decision-making processes for deploying thermal grids. Uh, there's a lot of work done to date on technologies and um, uh, success stories, but what we've done is we've peeled the onion around the success and gone deep into what was it that made it successful, what were the strategies. So at this point, I want to also thank my co-authors here, Anna Chittam to my left, Anna from Gridcraft and IDA, uh, Jung Jun Lee is representing Korea District Heating Corporation, which is very helpful in supporting content in the report. And Michael King, uh, my dear friend from the UK, who has been writing about this subject for many, many years, but has uh, provided very useful content in this report. So I just want you to, um, I think it's over 100 pages, uh, and we have two appendices, 12 case studies from these select countries. Uh, an appendix on tools, you'll find the appendix on tools available at your seats, and I want you to um, take the time after this uh, workshop to look at the report. So I'm going to provide a brief introduction of the agenda today. We are going to start off with uh, a very important context-setting piece, and that's to look at the political, economic, technological, and social context. Uh, Anna Chittam will provide an overview and talk about the countries that we've covered in our report, and that will be followed by a panel discussion that uh, we have panelists from Canada, Bruce Onder from Markham District Energy. Bruce has uh, been a past chair of IDEA and a uh, very experienced, insightful district energy uh, uh, system manager from South Korea, Jong Jun Lee, and then from UK, Michael King. Anna will follow that segment with uh, looking at policies. You know, what are some of the federal, state, and local policies that enable uh, successful district energy systems? Uh, we're going to have Tomas Smetnisova from Canada talk about procurement opportunities and challenges. You know, part of making a district energy system. Uh, work is procuring the system components and the challenges that uh, one has to face, both in the public and private sector, and getting all the, the components lined up. And then I will follow that with a look at the business models uh, that are in use across uh, successful systems. What are some of the best practices? What are some of the challenges and the lessons learned? And we are going to have three of the 12 case studies presented today. From the public uh, sector perspective, we'll have Aarhus, Aarhus from Denmark. Uh, Anna Chittam will talk about that. Jung Jun Lee will talk about Sangam from South Korea. And uh, Jim Lodge, who's our host for this conference and is busy uh, making all the things uh, happen today, will join us and talk about Phoenix here in um, Arizona. 
after lunch, we're going to look at an important aspect. Our research shows that district energy systems are not static. Uh, they have a life cycle. You know, they're conceived, uh, the feasibility studies, and then they're implemented, and they have a long life. They, uh, they need to be operated, maintained, and then sometimes modernized, and nowadays sold and acquired by uh, uh, other, peop other parties. Uh, we also have a panel discussion during that segment with Ken Smith from Evergreen Energy, uh, and Suresh Jambunathan from Veolia, I've seen Suresh this morning, and Jim Lodge from NRG. Michael Ahern is going to join us from Evergreen Energy. He's on a plane right now to talk about community-based energy planning for successful projects. So we're, we're covering the breadth of what it takes to be successful uh, in uh, implementing these systems. We also have a short video on stock, stakeholder engagement, stockholders, stakeholders too, but uh, that Helen Andrews Tipper from the Carbon Trust has sent in. She couldn't make it, but it's a, it's a very insightful video, 10 minutes or so that you will get to um, see this afternoon. And then Michael uh, will talk about capacity building, a very important aspect of success in these systems. And then we'll have time for open discussion. After each segment, feel free to ask questions. I think there's a mic up front here. And we'd love to have engagement and also listen to what, you, uh, what your insights are to build on what we've found. So d district energy systems, as we know, live in communities. Uh, they work with municipal objectives and support cities as they grow and uh, modernize and urbanize. But success really requires a balancing act. Um, it's, it's really looking at physical, financial, environmental, and social landscapes and seeing how, as a systems provider, you can meet as many of these objectives as possible and still have an economically viable system. So this is the concept that we have produced for the life cycle of a district energy system, starting with the concept um, you, you have to spend a lot of time developing the concept before you open the valve to go to the next stage. So we'll cover this in detail in the afternoon. But we've also identified some key factors that we call them the RIMPT, uh, you know, set of factors, risk, information, money, people, and tools. And it, all of the systems that we've looked at, and I'm sure you will identify these factors in your own systems, is that getting from vision to viability requires paying attention to some of these key factors. And I wanted to end with this slide because this is, this is a slide that shows that the district energy industry continues to grow. Uh, this is produced by IDA, we call it, uh, we um, get this information uh, from folks who volunteer uh, system growth and district Cooling systems, as we know, are growing more rapidly these days than district heating systems, as our folks from the Middle East will testify. But in general, district energy systems are continue to move forward. Um, they are, a lot of them are doing it right. Doing it right, I think, as Bruce uh, and Michael will tell you, is very important because um, a failed project is not just a failed project. It, reflects poorly on the whole industry. So our hope is that with this workshop, you have insights and information and make connections with experts and service providers so that when you, it's time for you to look at your project or system, you can bring those to bear on your system. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Anna Chittam. Anna is energy planner and she founded Gridcraft. She's a consultant and researcher in federal, state, and local energy policy programs with a specific focus on CHP, district energy, microgrids, energy efficiency programs, and comprehensive energy planning. Um, she has a bachelor's of economics from Gonzaga University and a master's in urban planning from Columbia University and has been a co-author with me on the report, and I look forward to her discussion and presentation, which I line up. <clears throat> oh, 
These are these are Bruce's slides. Hang on. Don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Okay. Good morning. How are you all doing today? Good. Um, I guess I can't really stand back because then you can't hear me, so I'll go ahead and stay right here. Um, so as Lakshmi mentioned, um, today's workshop really draws significantly from this report, um, and I do encourage you to spend a couple hours an entire afternoon <laughs> reading the report. Um, we're not going to sit here and um, uh, you know, recount all of that verbatim, but what we are trying to do is tease out a couple of the interesting takeaways that we as a group thought were um, um, uh, some of the kind of key lessons that we learned, um, especially, you know, uh, us having been embedded in this world for a long time, I think doing this report, um, a couple of, of interesting um, trends and ideas emerged. And so what I want to talk a little bit about right now this morning uh, before we move to our panelists is some of those trends that I think are shaping um, kind of the district energy systems that we, we see today. So um, we identify um, quite a few trends in the report. Um, and uh, you can see this whole list here. Um, the political unknowns at the bottom, I think, is um, becoming uh, even a, a bigger trend in a lot of areas of the country, and uh, we could talk a little bit more about that and sort of how people are addressing that uh, maybe in our discussion period later today. But I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, nodal development and integration of renewable resources because we're definitely seeing um, more interest in um, developing kind of smaller scale nodal systems with the expectation that later on down the line, they will be aggregated into larger systems. And I think it's a real opportunity that um, hasn't uh, been as, um, as, as frequent in the district energy um, world for, uh, you know, in, in the recent past. And then integration of renewable resources, we're seeing a lot of local and state and provincial and regional goals for renewable energy, not to mention um, a lot of the national goals, the EU goals, um, and so just translating those renewable goals that are often thought of as um, electricity goals into um, specific goals carved out for the district heating and district cooling sector is something that we're seeing um, successful district energy systems do. And, um, and we're seeing you know, representatives of those systems really establish district energy as one of the opportunities to reach uh, renewable energy goals. Um, so, for for one example of the nodal development, and this is this is um, kind of I would say representative of some of the new systems that we're seeing. Um, I I looked at the um, the Surrey City Energy System, and and what I think is really interesting about this, and I will say again that um, kind of everything that we're presenting here is in the report. So if you can't if you don't want to write it all down, you'll find it in the report. Um, the the Surrey City Energy System, um, there there was a recognition by the city that they wanted to um, develop a a new system to meet this expanded downtown area where they were going to be targeting a lot of their new density. Um, but they were not ready to fully identify um, what the resources, the long-term generation resources would be. There was an expectation that there were potentially some renewable resource opportunities, but they weren't really ready to, um, to totally identify those and, and make those capital investments. So what they did is they began to build the system out in a nodal fashion, and they actually installed um, temporary gas boilers in some cases to make sure that um, you know the the services to the buildings was there and developers who could be confident in the fact that they could develop a building and there would be you know hot water there'd be there'd be um, you know the, the heat resources that they need and then it it kind of allowed the city to buy some time to investigate some of their um, opportunities that were you know, possibly lower carbon or possibly would leverage local resources better. And then the expectation is that the temporary gas boilers will stick around and they might be used as emergency backup or something like that. Um, and so you know, I think that um, the, this idea that if you want to build a new district energy system, you have to you know, build the entire thing right away, um, we're definitely seeing a little bit of a pullback from that and a recognition that 
you can look at a couple of buildings or one building and you can look at another building a couple blocks away and you can think about, you know, 10 years down the line, how you might integrate those two systems, uh, even if you can't build that entire system right now. Um, and there's some other um, examples of that um, in the report as well. And then another major trend that we've seen is um, systems that are really designed to maximize and best optimize existing renewable energy resources. And so one example I like is um, Hamilton Community Energy's McMaster Innovation Park, um, which is up in Ontario, Canada. Um, and this particular um, system has kind of three, I sort of think of it as um, three tranches of energy resources that it relies on. So there was a, an identification of um, um, geo exchange opportunities. So this is kind of the, the geothermal heat pumps. There was a recognition that that, that, that um, opportunity was there and was potentially cost effective, um, but it was not going to meet the full demand. There was also an interest in solar. Um, and so what the, the, the facility is structured such that the, um, the geo exchange bank is essentially um, operating uh, to kind of meet and fill in the, some of the gaps from the solar thermal resource that is deployed there. And then there are natural gas boilers that um, address the peak. And so there's kind of these three different um, uh, bands of resource availability to make sure that they can meet all the peak needs, but also taking advantage and really maximizing uh, the renewable resources there. So that's definitely something we're seeing a lot more systems that are structured like that. And I think that's really compelling and interesting, especially to city leaders who are establishing uh, renewable energy um, uh, goals and, and, um, and long-term targets. Um, so I, I want to just kind of switch into those. Those are some of the trends. And then we also tried to really look at um, the drivers, so things that are actually maybe kind of tipping the scale or they're sort of the, the, final, the final thumb on the scale to make um, a system actually move forward or make new investments in a system move forward. And we, we separate them into economic, environmental, and social drivers. Um, and I just want to kind of hone in on um, two of those that I think are um, some of the, the bigger drivers right now. Um, and one is uh, climate change mitigation and concerns about um, reducing greenhouse gases. And so one of our case studies is Paris, France, um, that has a, um, you know, they've had a, a district energy system for a long time, um, but they were looking to um, reduce the greenhouse gases of, um, of the entire city. And so um, the city early on recognized that renewable district heating was um, one of the um, most cost-effective uh, ways and tools that they had to reduce their greenhouse gases citywide. Um, and then, so the city established their own goal. The EU obviously has their own goals. France has, um, you know, there's a, a carbon tax framework. So, um, so Paris was able to, um, to basically take their, their city goals and turn that into requirements for their, one of their um, district energy operators as part of the concession structure. And so um, while there was uh, an initial goal to increase the, the share of renewables in the district energy system um, to 60%, um, uh, that, that goal existed. And then the city came back and said, you know, as part of this concession agreement, um, we actually want you to reach 75%. And they were directly involved with the um, district energy company to identify, in this particular case, um, some geothermal um, uh, opportunities. They did a big study and helped the uh, district energy company identify how to sort of most cost effectively integrate that into the system. And the, the district energy company um, then was a, a partner in one of the investments in a new, um, a new uh, geothermal system. So, um, you know, we see kind of these, these top-down drivers and um, influencing these city drivers. And because the regulatory scheme, which we'll get into a little bit, um, is, you know, so varied, you, I think a lot of the cities are starting to find opportunities um, to integrate certain greenhouse gas and, and renewable energy goals in whether it's a concession or it's other types of um, leverage that they're giving to the district energy system. And so we talk a little bit more about that um, in the report. And then another main driver that we're seeing kind of across the board is this resilience driver. Um, and I, I think it's funny because I, I made this slide um, before uh, the Phoenix area hit some record um, uh, temperature peaks last week. 
But really, um, the notion of thermal resilience is driving um, some new entities to connect. And in the Phoenix area, the Maricopa County um, Sheriff's Office actually uh, connected to the um, one of the existing district cooling systems, in part because they wanted to make sure that you know at at peak summer um, uh, uh, energy demand periods, if the grid went down, the electric grid went down, they wanted to make sure that their system was going to remain and their building was going to remain um, comfortable and um, it was not going to become a, a public health type of hazard. Um, and then beyond thermal resilience, we're also seeing drivers in electric system resilience. Um, and, and this is something that I think um, district energy systems have maybe not done a great job of making the case for, but there's a really excellent example um, at the University of British Columbia where um, the existing um, electric infrastructure was regularly, one of the substations was regularly operating um, very near its peak. And so um, BC Hydro was very concerned about this. And so when the University of British Columbia um, updated and expanded um, their district energy system, they were able to show that they, um, by, by generating um, a lot of the, um, the heat on site, they were able to reduce the electric demand on the substation. And so that was so beneficial to BC Hydro that they're actually paying the university for that benefit. And that's something that we're seeing um, in, in a lot of other instances, um, even in, in kind of throughout the US where there are electric utilities that are saying, you know, it's actually more cost effective for us to pay to have this type of resource diverted to, um, you know, to be met by a district energy system rather than, um, you know, putting in a new substation or making major investments in our distribution system. Um, so that's something that we see um, definitely driving um, a lot of new um, system consideration and an expansion of existing systems. So I'm going to pause there, and I'm going to introduce my esteemed panel. Ooh, do I have my bios? I'm just going to introduce, I think, all three of them at one time, and then we can just kind of go down the line. So first, we are going to hear from Bruce Onder, who is president and CEO of Markham District Energy. Um, he's held this position uh, since 2002. Uh, Markham District Energy, for those of you who don't know, it's a thermal energy utility owned by the city of Markham. Uh, Mr. Onder has spent over 35 years in Ontario's energy sector developing community energy systems and CHP facilities. He has been a chair of the International District Energy Association, as well as the Canadian District Energy Association and the Association of Power Producers in Ontario. Um, in 2013, he was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, I didn't know that, uh, from the Government of Canada in recognition of the recipient's contribution to the municipal sector in Canada. That's really, that's really wonderful. Um, so we're very happy to have Bruce here. Um, then we're going to be hearing from Jong Joon Lee. He is with the Korea District Heating Corporation. He is a senior researcher there. Um, he's responsible for um, research on power plant performance. He holds a bachelor, master's, and PhD in mechanical engineering from Inha University. And then after Zhang Jun Lee, we will hear from Michael King, who is the director of District Energy Development Limited. Uh, he is the principal there, and he has 23 years of experience in the sector, encompassing consultancy, development, research, lobbying, and authorship. He is currently engaged in developing a uh, uni uh, United Kingdom municipally owned district energy procurement agency, uh, which is based on an existing model in Stockholm, Sweden. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Northeast London Polytechnic and a Master of Science in organization and policy from the London School of Economics. So while we're waiting for Anna to find the question she's going to ask the panel, are there any thoughts from the audience? Anything you want us to cover? I, I briefly went over the agenda. Are there topics that uh, keep you up at night? Anything you want us to pose at the workshop? I know it's still early, so if you, if you think of something, I mean, we do want you to engage. Um, Okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to have each of our panelists present the political, economic, social context, and uh, then we will have the panel discussion. Thank you. So Bruce. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Scottsdale, and uh, greetings from Canada. Uh, if you're 
attending the next year's conference. We'll be in Canada, so we'll welcome you there as well, hopefully. Um, this is a great report, by the way. Um, I have read it. I have spent the afternoon a few weeks ago reading it, and uh, there's a lot of meat to it. It was well done. Um, I guess from my perspective, also, it, it, um, it doesn't cover everything, you know, as I think about my system and things that I've learned, and this is a very complicated business, I, th I think. So Anna has um, uh, helped me out by populating a few slides um, that I've looked at and, and reviewed. Um, the two case studies from Canada that the report deals with uh, is the N-Wave system in, in Toronto and the Southeast Falls Creek system in the, in the Vancouver area. And so these, these three driver areas, it starts with economic drivers, and I found it interesting that under N-Wave, for example, they talked about N-Wave over many years, uh, provided a dividend to the city of Toronto. Uh, that's a good thing. And ultimately, uh, after running for many decades, uh, share appreciation got to the point the city decided to sell to the private sector uh, to Brookfield, and um, and they made a, a, a nice profit on, on their investment. Um, so yes, it provided a revenue to the city of Toronto as, a, as an owner for the over the many years, and, and undoubtedly rates were uh, competitive for the, the customers of N-Wave uh, for both heating and cooling. And then you get into Vancouver, talking, and some of the points out of the study talking about the rate structure, um, not front-end loading to... to uh, to the customers in this new system. That's pretty important or it wouldn't have got off the ground. Um, as I think about these two uh, points around uh, Vancouver and Toronto, there's a focus on rates. Um, I think when you talk about economic drivers, rates are only part of it. In fact, in Markham, we think in terms of the district energy um, uh, service to our customers as a premium service. So we're never trying to get to the point where our the definition of our rates are equal or cheaper than the, uh, than the, than, than the status quo, I, in other words, in, in building systems. And for Markham, um, again, Markham wasn't a case study in this report, but uh, the economic driver for Markham's investment uh, wasn't necessarily the return on investment of the Markham District Energy to, the, to our shareholder. It was the economic development um, uh, drivers. Um, it's, it's interesting that our, our system, which is not all that old, is we're in our 17th year, we've attracted major investments by IBM and Bell. We've recently attracted a university campus, uh, which will be in, in construction next year. And if you th talk to our um, city shareholder, they'll tell you the economic development value of, the, of these investments in the market because of the district energy system dwarfs the return on investment of the actual company itself. So the you know the 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 economic driver is the is the business that attracts uh, to the city. The other point um, made under the economic drivers uh, area was in Toronto and Vancouver taking advantage of local local resources. In the case of of uh, Vancouver, it was a sewer energy um, which was right there on the property. And in Toronto, of course, although Toronto had a district heating system for many many years taking advantage of the, um, of the uh, latent heat in the, or cooling in the, in the lake. Um, world-class world -class project um, in terms of taking uh, many, many millions of square feet off of uh, electricity grid for, for cooling. So the, I guess the point there was taking advantage, there's, there's windows of opportunity in district energy, whether it's a development opportunity or uh, you know, in the case in the case of Vancouver, it was the Olympic Games. There was a short window that opened. The Olympic Games was coming. Uh, those behind the system saw uh, this district energy system development saw there was an opportunity. They probably had a one-year window to make a decision, yes or no, um, to go to go with that. To in this case in Vancouver to meet emission reduction goals, but to develop a system. And and once that window has passed it's passed. Uh, Toronto for me is an interesting city because it has N-Wave, which has been around for a long time, has a deep lake water cooling, but Toronto is a big city and it's a growing city. And I've said at various conferences, my disappointment in our sector is one of the, uh, Toronto missed one of the big opportunities 
uh, that I've ever s seen. There's a lake, lake water development, uh, millions and millions of square feet, where district energy was to be part of the platform. And for a variety of reasons, um, governance reasons, uh, pushback from, from, from the developers, because they were looking for rates that were cheaper than the alternative. And that's a, that's a, very, that's a very tricky discussion. Based on your assumptions, what's cheaper um, as opposed to trying to figure out what is competitive and what's a superior service, to make a long story short, that platform, um, the Disra Energy uh, um, you know, proposal fell, uh, fell down, um, it was canceled, and we've got millions and millions of square feet of buildings going up in Toronto with conventional boilers and chillers on the roof. And that will be the, that will be the, stat, that's the status for that development area for 50 years. So there are there are, there are windows of opportunity um, that we have to that we have to pick up on. The deep lake water cooling in Toronto was interesting. You know, uh, this was this was published a couple of years ago uh, in taking uh, in, in connecting all the all the buildings to deep lake, deep lake water cooling. They'd removed almost eighty thousand tons of CO two, um, and that's the fifteen thousand. 15,800 cars off the road. I think those, num those numbers are always changing because at the time this was displacing coal power at the margin. In Ontario, coal power, uh, we've eliminated coal power electricity generation in Ontario a few years ago. Um, and, uh, but none nonetheless, it's a, signif it's a significant number. Um, this, there was a point on social drivers in Vancouver that uh, Anna uh, brought out of the report for me. Uh, again, related to rates, um, and uh, so rate stabilization, competitive rates, I suppose you could view that as a social driver for the customers. When I think of social drivers, I think of other things, such as resiliency, um, and, and the fact that you have a thermal grid gives you that flexibility um, in the future. I mean, that's another um, definition of sustainability, having that fuel flexibility in the future in the event that uh, 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 fuel prices or carbon tax or whatever is driving us from uh, fossil to renewable or, or, or to other fuels. Um, one of the great examples in Ontario, uh, where I came from in the 70s, the utility at the time, which was a monopoly, uh, Ontario Hydro, uh, they had a very strong marketing, um, uh, for those from Ontario you might remember, that live better electrically. So live better electrically meant a lot of buildings went on for electric heat. Um, and 30 years later, these, were, uh, these, were in, these buildings were in real trouble if they were condos or simple rental properties. And the, the other term that I find interesting, I don't know whether this came from the UK, Michael, um, fuel poverty. Yes. Is, that a, is that a UK? Um, really, into, I've, I've, I'm starting to think about that, fuel poverty. That, that's what I'm talking about, is, is the uh, uh, inflexibility of switching from one field to another because of certain design decisions we've made in our communities. So again, that's where district energy will, is one of our great promises, is having that uh, flexibility around uh, the thermal supply. So I've added one last um, slide, just to a uh, few observations that might help the discussion. Um, from my perspective, and it was pretty evident to me in reading the report, there are a few district energy systems that we talk about that are technically the same. Um, uh, Southeast Falls Creek and N-Wave are two great examples of our diversity uh, in terms of size and fuel and, 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 uh, and technology. Taking advantage of the local opportunity is key. In the case of Vancouver, it was the Olympic Village project. There was a very, as I said, a very short window. They had to make a decision. And in the, in the city of Toronto, the deep lake water cooling had been uh, on the table for uh, some time. Uh, people have been thinking about it, frankly, for decades. Uh, um, but the fact that the city was looking at its future water supply from deep in the lake was the opportunity to work with the city, uh, N-Wave to work with the city to also extract the, uh, the cooling energy at the same time. I find we far we too often focus, focus on rates. Is, our, is district energy solution cheaper than the status quo? It's, 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 a, it's a mugs game because your, your, your decision whether one, thing is, whether one solution is cheaper than the other is, is based on your assumptions. How long will conventional equipment last? What is, what is, what is its efficiency? Um, 
when we have this discussion as rates being the driver for our, our decisions around energy, it just drives us to short-term, low-cost alternative solutions, um, and, which has been my, one of my frustrations for, for, for many, many years. Um, customer connections and the retention of those customers is a challenge that we all share. Even though the sy systems are different, technology, size, uh, customer connection, uh, how do you get there? Uh, is, a, is a challenge we all f we all share in one way or another, and I, I I have to say that mandatory connection, which is also mandatory or a regulated rate structure, is not necessarily the solution. In our case in Markham, and I can speak to this uh, later in the discussion, uh, we don't have mandatory connection. We we uh, we have a competitive uh, energy contract that we offer to our customers. We spend most of our time talking to our customers around. Uh, the benefits of having a district energy connection to the building, whether it's a hospital or a condo or a uh, sports complex, we then turn to rates. We, after we've convinced them, I, I, I think successfully, that this is a premium service for the building uh, and for the operation over many years, um, the, uh, then we turn to rates. And it's, it's fascinating how it's cheaper, it's a premium, it, it, that becomes less of a discussion factor in the decision. And I have to say, we don't have mandatory connection to Markham, but we've had 100% connection uh, success. Um, we haven't had one building at the end of the day turn us down. And there's, there's some reasons for that as well, which I can talk uh, later about. Uh, the, so I guess the other conclusion in, in reading the report, um, as it goes through all these various uh, case studies, there's no one ownership or governance model that I think is superior. Um, uh, private, public, private, or government controlled. We're a hybrid of, of those. We are a private uh, for-profit corporation. We happen to have a, a single municipal shareholder at the time. Um, and that if our shareholder like the City of Toronto did uh, a few years ago sold us, we would suddenly have a different ownership structure. So there's no one model I think that is superior. They all have their applications in certain situations. Uh, they all have their pros and cons, but I will, I will say this. Um, district energy is far different than other energy investments, uh, power plant or wind farm or uh, solar farm. Uh, this, is a municipal, this is a municipal decision. So ownership aside, every successful that I've observed, every successful district energy launch has the municipal support at the outset. Doesn't need to be investment or ownership. But it certainly has the the uh, um, it, the municipality should be driving it uh, because it's not just the investment in the district energy platform; it's the economic development benefits that to spin off. It's the environmental uh, priorities of the of the municipality. So um, governance, whether it's ownership governance or the the champion, if you like, uh, needs to come from the municipality. That's been a consistent uh, observation uh, for for me. The other, the last point I'll make, Anna, just uh, before I sit down, is, um, is when we talk when we talk about the uh, economic uh, competitiveness of the district energy and the economic development piece in Markham, one of the things that uh, has been interesting is as we we do we do not require our customers to pay us a connection fee. We don't require anything from them other than signing a long-term uh, energy agreement with us, which has fixed and variable rate components to it. And what's interesting is the most of our customers would have a higher um, return on equity expectation and a shorter time frame. So when we apply our capital and our weighted average cost of capital to connecting our customers, we do have a 20 to 40 year horizon. And it doesn't really matter, as we're assuming in our model, uh, in our pro forma for our shareholder that the building will be connected to our system for for much longer than 20 years, 20, 30, 50, 60 years. So we have that, when we apply that investment uh, criteria, we're taking a large, um, a large piece out of their investment uh, criteria of their project. And that, that, that difference of the model is really working. They, they like the avoidance of capital with those restrictions on their side and, and the cost of capital on our side. So that's, uh, that's a big economic development. Uh, uh, factor. So, Anna, that's that's all for today. Thank you, Bruce. And we will have a discussion so you can um, hold your questions until we get to the discussion portion. Um, Jong Joon, you ready to tell us a little bit about South Korea?
morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for introducing me. And uh, uh, before I starting my presentation, uh, please apologize me about my English. Is uh, actually my uh, English is not my mother language, and so it's not comfortable to speak or uh, presenting about uh, using English. So sometimes you cannot understand what I what is he talking about. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so. Uh, before I start my presentation, yeah, I said I, I want to say that uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Sangam's case about in uh, in South Korea, and I'm going to uh, focusing on the political, economics, and social content. And then I will I, actually I preparing a, a small part of the uh, current status of uh, South uh, KDHC in after presentation, so uh, let's start the presentation. Yeah, first drivers is uh, actually the same as a uh, Canadian case. Uh, I mean, uh, we have a focus on the uh, economic drivers, environmental drivers, and uh, political drivers maybe. And so first the thing is the economic drivers. Uh, the, uh, Actually, the Sangam area is a part of the uh, Seoul metropolitan city. And we are in general regular revenue stream for the waste from uh, its waste management system, which the district en energy system pays for as its uh, primary fuels. Actually, Sangam has uh, uh, three different kind of fuels. We, we use the three different kind of fuel. Uh, one is uh, rent uh, Second one is uh, gas, and the other one is uh, 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 wasted, wasted garbages. We we burn the garbage. So we have a uh, three different kind of uh, fuels using, and uh, uh, primary fuels is uh, red fuel. And uh, previous managing the waste in red fuel was a uh, cost, uh, and increasing local economic uh, competitiveness is the red fuel gas that is used by the district system was already available. Uh, by using solid waste for this uh, productive purpose, the city could reduce the amount of waste that would otherwise uh, significate in the landfill. Uh, and the uh, rent is very scarce in uh, scarce in Sangam, so filling up rent for others, higher value, used to have half the economic development. That is the economic drivers. And the second one is the environmental driver. So uh, when I talk about the environmental drivers, I have to talking about uh, the South Korea's uh, status about about uh, uh, renewable energy policy and uh, something. So uh, actually, the South Korea want to, to increase the uh, renewable energy amount of the uh, entire uh, energy system. So especially the Sangam area is the national goal. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, uh, Sangam area is uh, national goals requiring the uh, district heating resources to be addressed 10% renewable, renewable energy by 2022. So uh, with the establishment of a waste to energy as uh, renewable resources, the city took advantage of its existing waste resources and made a product, uh, productive use of them. So. Uh, it, this uh, slide shows the, the plan for distributed power generation in South Korea. And, and as you can see, the, we are planning the, the distributed energy amount in, in the red line, and the renewables is a uh, green line, and the total power amount is a uh, blue line. The, we, we are preparing, we are planning to, the, we will uh, up increase the district energy and the renewable energy and by the 2029, 
Uh, and the next uh, drivers is a social driver. In South Korea, large size, uh, large size house, uh, housing development must uh, utilize the district. We should uh, use the, the uh, district energy if, if uh, the area uh, setting the district energy zone, then the district energy zone must using the district energy. Okay, and the government uh, competitively select a company to offer uh, those uh, these services. And this ensure that uh, new developments will offer uh, future, um, sorry, offer that uh, the future tenants uh, low cost energy, impacting a large portion of the population immediately because so many people reside in uh, these housing development. As an additional driver, the Sang Am district uh, was able to transform that uh, what was formerly a landfill into a, a desirable. A residential area. Yes. Uh, after I, I will uh, introducing the uh, KDHC. Uh, the hist uh, first part is the history of the KDHC. Actually, in uh, in 1978, after the oil crisis, uh, the Korea government considered to introduce the district uh, district heating system as a uh, politically for the purpose of energy conservation and greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, as a result, KDHC established in 1985 uh, as a government-founded corporation. And then in 1991, uh, government uh, make a, a development of a new cities of metropolitan area we have uh, many uh, new uh, metro many new cities in metropolitan area so and then uh, government adopting the act of the district heating and cooling law uh, according to this law the new city must be provided uh, district heating and cooling uh, if the city exceeds a certain scale and then and uh, in 2001, yeah, the structure reforming of electric power industry was uh, announced. So in in according to this law, so uh, district heating and cooling companies can enter in the electric power market. Now I will talk about the current status of uh, Korea District Heating Corporation. It's not. Uh, entire Korean uh, district heating. I, it's, it's just uh, Korea district heating corporation's status. And uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this table showing the annual trend of district heating propagation in uh, in South Korea. And in you can see the uh, 1995. Can you see? The, yeah, in 1995, uh, 1995, and uh, you can. Uh, comparing the uh, 2014, we have uh, dramatically increased the uh, total. Uh, in total means uh, total households we, we are supplying, and, and uh, uh, sorry, we are total requirement and we uh, it is, uh, is supply, and the supply rate is uh, uh, 5.5 from the 1995 to 12.7 uh, in. 2017, and uh, the number of companies means the we the district energy company in South Korea. Uh, in 1995, we only have uh, two companies. Then uh, now we have uh, 36 companies. In, as you can see, the uh, approximately 20, 20 years, right? And we have uh, dramatically increased the district heating and cooling uh, business in South Korea. Uh, propagation rate of a DHC uh, increased uh, more than twice. Uh, yeah, that can see that. And the trend of a DHC in Korea, in South Korea, as uh, 36 district heating companies and uh, 59 sites we have. And 2.43 billion uh, households are using the district energy, and especially uh, in Cor uh, Korea District Heating Corporation. Uh, Supplying the heat into uh, to the 1.3 million household and and to 1,010 build, uh, 100 buildings. Sorry. 
this slide shows the current state of Korean District Heating Corporation. In this, uh, we have our branches in here and uh, subsidiary companies. We have uh, two subsidi uh, subsidiary companies. And uh, this part shows the uh, metropolitan area of South Korea. Uh, you mean, I mean the in Seoul metropolitan South uh, metropolitan net area. The, here is the uh, uh, Seoul, and this part is uh, new cities. And we connecting the every cities using a pipeline. It's approximately uh, in that, but maybe um, one thousand kilometer, maybe. Yes, it's very very long. Yeah, pipelines and companies. Ta uh, companies table show is the uh, ninety seven, uh, eighteen seven versus uh, twelve. So we uh, our set is uh, increased the ninety percent. This slide shows the integrated energy supply zone. I mean, that means the district energy zone. Uh, you, when the government make uh, new cities, then government. Uh, announcing the dis in, uh, integrity energy supply zone like as the rules so yeah it's the most in, uh, important thing in south korea uh, how to increase the district energy in south korea if you asking me then i can say that uh, government make the district energy business in south korea yes okay thanks so much Thank you, Jong Joon. Okay, now we are going to hear from Michael King, who's going to um, talk about about what a third of the way across the globe from South Korea, the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, so, um, in the uh, the UK, it's not a uh, a very big uh, district heating country in uh, Europe. Um, we've always had uh, abundant supplies of uh, of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, coal was the uh, foundation of the industrial revolution uh, back in the uh, uh, 17th and 18th century. Uh, we still got about 200 years worth of reserves still in the ground, and more latterly uh, discovered oil and gas off the uh, um, the northeast coast. Um, what district heating uh, there is is uh, is relatively small. Uh, it's in uh, um, mainly social housing, uh, public housing estates that were constructed after the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Second World War during the uh, reconstruction phase between 1950 and 1970, and only comprises uh, about uh, two percent of the uh, of the market uh, for heat. Now, I kind of became involved in the, uh, the district energy sector from the uh, uh, perspective of, uh, of uh, fuel poverty, which uh, Bruce referred to, and uh, I would like to say that, uh, you know, that, that was a driver uh, for doing uh, communal systems uh, for heat networks, but in fact, uh, it, it wasn't really. Uh, the best, I suppose, we did is actually like uh, uh, defend what was there, um, which came under threat when uh, uh, gas was discovered uh, off the, uh, the northeast coast in the North Sea, um, brought ashore, and in fact, 80% uh, um, of the country relies on its, uh, uh, it, for its heating needs on gas, and so that is the uh, predominant fu uh, uh, um, uh, fuel. What actually kind of uh, really uh, changed things, um, oops, gone the wrong way, uh, was the whole issue of, uh, of climate change. This, this was uh, discovered in uh, uh, the early uh, noughties and uh, culminated uh, in the UK in the uh, adoption by uh, government of the uh, Climate Change Act in 2008. And this actually committed the, uh, uh, the country to uh, reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2050 against uh, a 1990 baseline. Now this is right across the economy. It's, it's not just the uh, power sector, it's also agriculture, industry, shipping, aviation, uh, but also heat. 
Now, uh, some of these things are a bit easier. For example, electricity, much easier to tackle than heat, and so consequently, it's going to have to make uh, more rapid progress and deeper cuts in carbon emissions in order to accommodate um, uh, ones which are a bit more difficult to uh, tackle, such as uh, agriculture. What do you do about cows that uh, produce methane? You know, you just can't do much about it. And so therefore, things have to be uh, uh, adjusted elsewhere. The other interesting thing is that it uh, also established this expert uh, committee, uh, the Committee on Climate Change, to advise government on progress. And this is made up uh, by uh, a load of senior academics uh, with a supporting staff that uh, review policies, um, and uh, 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 programs, uh, market developments, technology developments, and what have you, and advise government on progress uh, towards that 2050 target and, and make recommendations in terms of uh, 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 adjustments to uh, what's happening. Now, uh, they actually like, divide their work into five-year terms, which they referred to as budgets, and so the first one, 2008 to 12, and then uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they've published the, uh, uh, the fourth carbon budget and are currently kind of working on the, uh, the fifth one, which is from 28 to 32, and within that is that they're taking a particular interest in heat and last November published this paper, uh, Next Steps for UK uh, Heat Policy, and I've given the reference there, and it's, it's uh, worth having a look at um, because uh, some very interesting stuff in there. Now, let's see if I get this right this time. So that's just uh, th how they're kind of working. That is the like, trajectory of uh, reductions that they uh, anticipate, and there are the, like, uh, the slices in terms of the budgets that they're kind of uh, uh, working on. You can see the, uh, the fourth carbon budget, they an anticipate a reduction down to 52%, um, uh, fifth carbon budget, 57% cut um, by uh, 2032. Now, uh, this is a scenario uh, drawn from that paper of what they anticipate it will be uh, or heating would look like in uh, uh, 2050. It's an infographic, if you like. Now, I mentioned that 80% of the country is reliant on gas for its heating needs, and there is an extensive gas network, a national gas network. Most uh, urban, uh, suburban, and even villages have kind of a gas network. Um, and what they are saying is that because uh, 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 natural gas is a fossil fuel, is that uh, that is going to have to change. And uh, consequently is that uh, a lot of it is actually going to have to be decommissioned. So old gas network now not used. Um, some of it is going to be repurposed for hydrogen. Um, outlying uh, uh, remote places, as you can see uh, uh, in pink, will like, uh, move to, uh, to heat pumps. Um, so these are in the, uh, the rural areas, uh, which are most probably not served by uh, gas networks anyway. But then in the urban areas, uh, um, over on the right-hand side, you can see is that it's primarily going to be low-carbon heat networks with possibly a few buildings that actually kind of uh, 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 being on um, a heat pump just for that particular building. Um, I think that that is unlikely, as I think most probably it'll all be uh, uh, heat networks, and that will actually kind of have industrial scale uh, heat pumps uh, um, actually like serving all of those areas. Now, of course, this has very much alarmed the, uh, the gas network companies uh, because that's their asset that they're talking about, and they're all getting very, very itchy about it. There's a lot of uh, lobbying saying that, oh, you know, hydrogen's is the answer to everything. Um, but in fact, the, we don't actually have any upstream production facilities for uh, hydrogen, and there'll be a massive kind of uh, um, uh, uh, investment required to build these um, electrolysis plants to build it, and they're talking about using uh, uh, ref uh, reformulated methane to produce the hydrogen, so they'd also need to build carbon capture and storage facilities uh, in order to do that, and so there is a kind of massive challenge. 
Now, um, the, what the, the Carbon Committee is, uh, uh, Climate Change Committee is saying is that at the moment is that the action now uh, needs to be on these kind of uh, four areas. Get on with the simple stuff in terms of in, uh, improving the efficiency of buildings uh, to reduce heating demand in the first place. Um, roll out heat pumps, heat networks, and uh, biomethane, and all of that is going along. Uh, build new homes to uh, a much higher standard so it drives down the, like, uh, the cost of heating and doesn't require costly re retrofitting at a later date, uh, but also begin to invest in uh, carbon capture and storage and uh, hydrogen, uh, leading to the 2020s when they will, the government will have to make a decision about what actually like, happens with the gas network. Is it going to continue uh, with uh, hydrogen or is it going to be decommissioned and we're going to move over more strongly into heat networks? So what is governments doing about this advice? Uh, so I'm just going to run through a quick uh, explanation of the uh, political structure of the United Kingdom because you're most probably not familiar with it. All of these uh, islands off the, uh, the, the northwest coast of Europe is known as the British Isles. Um, but the, uh, the one on the, like, uh, the left is, uh, is Ireland, and the one on the, uh, uh, the right is Great Britain. Great Britain contains three countries, uh, Wales, England, and Scotland. These are going back 1,200 years, um, but they're all one political entity. The people in Ireland, uh, back in 1921, decided to take themselves off, but the, like the, uh, the people in the northern province uh, uh, threatened insurrection if they, did, they didn't want to leave, and so therefore they remained part of what is known collectively as the United Kingdom. But in terms of uh, our interest uh, for this discussion, we're only kind of interested in Scotland and, uh, and uh, England because those are the most populous places. 55 to 6 million people in, in, uh, in England, uh, 5 million in Scotland. Now in England is that uh, they, uh, the uh, government has developed a policy framework uh, with a document, the future of heating backing in 2013. Focus, as uh, Bruce mentioned, is on municipalities, local authorities we call them, or LAs for short. And uh, they uh, established this heat network delivery unit to support local authorities with that kind of pre-development uh, 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 activities, heat mapping, policy development, early, early feasibility and techno-economic uh, assessment. They then kind of launched uh, just recently the uh, uh, Heat Networks Investment Project, and this is a five-year program, uh, 320 mil of, uh, 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 of money to uh, invest in the sector, and they believe that that is going to leverage uh, other investments uh, from other uh, sources, uh, giving a total of about two billion investment into the sector. Uh, current rates, that's about, I think, uh, uh, $2.4 billion, that, uh, but, but you've got to scale that uh, in terms of the United States, which is, what, about six times larger than, uh, uh, than we are. Um, but the overall objective of this is to kind of kickstart the industry um, and so that it no longer relies on uh, um, public subsidy in order to, uh, to kind of uh, 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 progress. So it's, it, uh, it will be self-sustaining. Alongside that, they encourage industry to develop a, uh, a consumer protection vehicle, the, uh, uh, the heat trust, and have also kind of worked with the uh, Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers and the Trade Association, the uh, um, ADE, to produce a kind of manual of uh, technical standards. Now, by contrast, in Scotland is that uh, they are taking a different route um, they actually did the, uh, uh, followed a, a similar trajectory in terms of uh, producing a policy document which contained a, a target. The, uh, the UK government didn't, sorry, the English one didn't have a target. This is of uh, um, 1.5 tetrawatt hours uh, from uh, heat networks and 40,000 homes connected. Now, in fact, that wasn't particularly challenging because it uh, incorporated the 10,000 that were already on kind of uh, heat networks. But uh, they have got better. They established uh, an expert commission on district heating to advise the government, and uh, some of the, my very good friends are uh, on that. Established a district heating loan fund, which is actually 
giving sort of fairly small amounts of money to uh, 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 at a kind of a very favorable rate, uh, public sector rates, to uh, help things uh, uh, get, get along, and also a heat network partnership uh, analogous to the uh, heat network delivery unit uh, in, in England. And that helps uh, coordinate support from different agencies for projects. But the really exciting stuff is that uh, last December, they launched a, a consultation on the regulation of, uh, of district heating. And this very much follows the, uh, the Danish model that, uh, uh, that Anna has talked about and will be talking about. Um, that uh, actually makes it mandatory for local authorities. To date, it's been voluntary for them to do so, but now it's been mandatory for them to develop uh, 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 heat and energy efficiency strategies, which is essentially like mapping out the demand and finding out uh, where things can be uh, solved through energy efficiency measures and, and also used to define where there are district heating zones. Um, there will be people that will be uh, 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 companies wishing to operate uh, in this sector will need to be licensed. So that will do all the due diligence and like checking out their kind of financials, their credibility, uh, their technical abilities, this, that, the next thing. And those licensed operators will be able to compete against each other for con exclusive concessions to develop and operate within those district heating zones. Um, those criteria will include affordability, decarbonisation, in terms of actually like moving uh, towards that, uh, that goal. Um, the local authorities, uh, they will encourage people to do these on uh, commercial negotiation. But if that fails, then the concessionaire can appeal to the local authority to actually obligate a building to connect if they, if they won't do it. So I think Bruce kind of uh, made reference to this, and this is very much following the, uh, uh, the Danish approach. A lot of like industrial waste heat there, and that should, uh, uh, they at the moment, are just asking to them to provide data so they know where it is. But the aim is 80% uh, of all buildings in, the, in Scotland will be connected to what they define as low carbon heat sources by 2032, which is really challenging considering that's only about 17 years away. So uh, my uh, final slide, uh, Lashmi is like flashing at me, um, is is just to uh, outline these kind of uh, these three kind of areas. Firstly, in terms of environmental drivers, I've mentioned that within the context of the UK, but the UK is still at the moment a uh, a member of the European Union. Uh, we are, uh, have, uh, are regretfully to me have uh, uh, elected to leave, but uh, that is democracy. Uh, but at the moment is that we are obliged to comply with uh, EU directives, and one of those, EU Directive of Energy Efficiency, requires each country to do an assessment of the potential for CHP, district heating and cooling. And that has been completed. Uh, that suggests that there is a technical capability, uh, possibility of 60% of all buildings in England being connected to uh, uh, heat networks, 7% in, uh, in Scotland. Now, the other like side is the economic drivers, is that uh, there has been an austerity program going on since uh, 2010, where uh, public uh, 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 taxpayer support for local authority municipal services have been cut. And a lot of them are actually seeking out new opportunities uh, uh, for revenue uh, raising that will help them support uh, frontline services. And a lot of them have found heat networks as an opportunity to actually set up for municipal energy companies which they can derive uh, revenue from. So that is actually uh, a great um, a thing at the moment. Um, it also helps that uh, the government is putting uh, 320 mil on the table at the same time, excites the, uh, uh, the financial director's interests, and also there's the, uh, at the bottom, the fuel poverty agenda that I refer to again, and the trilemma as it's uh, referred to, which is uh, uh, carbon reduction, uh, energy security, and affordability um, is incorporated into the uh, objectives in terms of reference for the Climate Change Committee, um, and uh, it will be incorporated uh, into 
uh, the Scottish Government's proposals on uh, heat regulation. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I just say is that there is this kind of different approach being uh, uh, advanced in England to, in, to that in Scotland. After five years, the 320 mil will be gone, whereas in Scotland is that the regulations will still be in place. Underwriting that kind of demand guarantee, the Scottish government hopes, will actually like de-risk the projects, so consequently investors can accept a lower rate of return. That will actually like drive down the, uh, uh, the cost of connection for buildings, make it much more attractive, and the whole thing would then kind of uh, uh, have a kind of uh, uh, snowball effect. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for overrunning a bit. Okay, um, so we are trying to stay within our allotted time. Um, so I'm going to limit, oh, um, I'm going to limit our questions a little bit and then maybe we can have some discussion a little bit later. So I have um, maybe I think about one question for each of you. I think I'll just start down, down the line. Um, and Bruce, you know, I think the, um, the fact that your system has 100% connection without a requirement to connect is kind of a stunning uh, fact, and um, I think our audience might be interested to know, um, you know, how have you achieved that, and what kind of information, specifically, and, and who, when you're looking at kind of new system expansion, who are the people that you are targeting most to try to get them on board? Well, I, the use of the word "stunning" might be over, <laughs> over. I but, so. it, but, it, but we're pr I guess we're proud of that that outcome. It, it's it's a strategy that we you know on district heating and cooling in Ontario is not regulated. This is not a regulated utility activity. So uh, uh, the systems in Ontario, for the most part, uh, that have developed are um, are uh, not mandatory, not mandated by the municipalities. So in Markham. Uh, we took a strategy a few years ago where when we started out that uh, the city of Markham, one thing it does control is the planning process, the planning approval process. So it encourages all developers, all developments building in the city to, uh, they have to go through the planning process and meet certain requirements, whether it's built form or use of open space or uh, its interaction with uh, transportation uh, services and certainly the sustainability agenda. So the city of Markham put on the uh, built um, uh, structure where the developers had to respond to all these priorities in order to move through the development process. And on, and on the sustainability file, uh, they offered the developers the opportunity to connect to district energy uh, in order to achieve um, approval, if you like, uh, points, if you, if you will. And, um, and in that regard, early on, the developers were encouraged to talk to the district energy company uh, to see if this was an option to possibly doing a lead building or uh, solar panels on the roof or green roofs or any number of other things that they could do to be to de uh, to deliver a sustainable um, uh, sustainable points or a sustainable building. And th the problem with a mandatory connection, of course, is um, mandating that they connect to the district energy platform uh, by the city and the city happens to own the company that is offering the rate structure uh, that's that's just uh, that was just um, something that would end up at, at, a, at an appeal uh, at what we call the Ontario Municipal Board um, there would be objection to that so the developers were given the opportunity to develop to connect to the district energy as an option and then we went to work you know, again, um, proposing uh, not only the benefits, we start. We always started with the benefits and ended with the rates. And at the end of the day, um, uh, the developers, uh, and, and, there are, and there are building owners that have a long-term interest in the building, and there's de developers that have a short-term interest, such as a condo developer, which will only have an ownership interest for a short period of time. But um, but we made that point, and it's a real it's a it's a very it's a very learned sales process. It took years for us, I think, to um, even before Markham District Energy f was formed, for some of us involved to to have learned that skill of how to talk about district energy, uh, not just from a rate perspective, from a but from a benefits perspective. So uh, it, it's it's worked very well for us. Yeah. Maybe I'll pause and see if anyone has any specific questions for Bruce. 
Yeah. When they do, when they do settle on a, on the rate review, yeah. Well, it's, that's that's really interesting. You know, it's not complicated, but it it does require uh, some work. If if a building owner who is literally looking at the district energy rate structure compared to what they would have otherwise done, which is in building systems, um, it's a really tricky piece of business because the equipment vendors, the chiller manufacturers or the boiler manufacturers, will talk about their efficiencies. A 90% boiler efficiency, or a, a you know chiller with a COP of six, and and there's no there's no test for those numbers. Um, so one of our biggest challenges when, in, in working with a building owner uh, to talk about the district energy rate structure as an alternative is getting these comparable efficiencies correct. And it's surprising to me how many consulting engineers, with all due respect to anybody in the room, that are in conventional building systems don't really know what the conventional building system efficiencies are for equipment. They know what the uh, nameplate efficiency is, but they don't really have any knowledge of whether that an 85% of boiler efficiency nameplate boiler actually operates on a life cycle basis closer to 68 or 70 or 72%. So that's a, so we have had two barriers when we've had this discussion. We don't have this barrier anymore, by the way. The, the building, the developers in our city center uh, they don't even talk about this anymore with us. It's just a given their new buildings will connect to our system because we've gone through this uh, light, we've gone through this process with them on more than one occasion. But we found two barriers, if I can, and if I can just add, the two barriers we had was the equipment manufacturers who claim these high efficiencies for in-building systems without any requirement to prove it um, and very little information to prove it. Um, and the other, the other barrier we had was the building contractors uh, and engineering and consulting engineers that are, that had, had a natural, um, there was a natural, <laughs> uh, uh, co there was natural competition for the district energy option. They would lose millions of dollars of, of, of cost in the building that drives engineering fees or, or equipment sales. So um, this, what we found was in the early days with a new building owner developer that had never connected to a district energy system either in Markham or anywhere else, the sales process took a year. And we always started with the owner. We never start with we never sat down with the owner's engineer. Just frankly due to the natural uh, the natural barrier that was there. We always started with the owner and, and warned them that there would be um, uh, opposing views from the well, from their conventional suppliers, equipment and consultants and contractors. So, it's, it, but that you know that it was that was a learned process that took years. Um, I think maybe we'll wait until we get through questions with the two, and then maybe we'll open it up to the questions for the whole panel. Just want to make sure that we get everyone a, an opportunity to speak. Um, Zhang Jun, one one thing I um, noticed about the case study. Um, in Sangam was that there there was some resistance to um, having landfill gas um, and having that be something that residents um, you know could accept as being in their backyard and I'm I'm wondering um, what did you do to overcome some of that resistance? Uh, in some case, uh, to be honest. Uh, uh, we do not do any special activities uh, to uh, for residents around the Sangam flat because uh, Sangam is uh, naturally a red field site. So uh, around the Sangam place, uh, not much uh, residents uh, are living before. So, uh, so within the three kilometer radius, it, we we have uh, not much people are living there. So. <laughs> The city of Seoul creates an uh, environmental park in, in, uh, on the uh, Randipri site and uh, after the end of its life at, uh, in the Randipri site. And uh, covering the tops of Randipri with uh, soils and uh, two parks uh, 
built and made many holes. And then we put the, the rent per gas and using the, that horse. So, uh, and the rent per gas is sold to my companies very cheaply. As it, that means the, the residents are happy we, when we many make uh, some parks and they make a land per uh, facility that they, I'm not sure, but many people are becoming uh, happy. So they, the they like the fact yeah. that the parks yeah. were a, a new asset to the, the neighborhood? Right. Interesting, right. okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'll jump to um, Michael. Michael, um, I know that um, in the UK there have been a lot of new tools, kind of technical tools and analysis tools that um, the, the national government has been trying to develop and try to encourage uh, municipalities to, to use, and, and municipalities obviously have some of their own tools in terms of assessing uh, heat resources and, and opportunities, and I'm wondering, what do you think have been the most kind of useful tools or useful um, maybe model pieces of policy that have been uh, developed at the national level? What what is the what is the the national government done that has been sort of most um, uh, helpful to maybe smaller municipalities that don't have you know a lot of those resources? Um, well, it's interesting because it sort of follows on uh, a bit from what uh, Bruce was saying, is that um, actually having these uh, national bodies such as the Heat Delivery Unit uh, uh, and the Heat uh, Network Partnership in Scotland is the, uh, the standardization of, uh, of processes. So we were getting uh, reports coming in from consultants and some were using IRR and others were using uh, um, NPV and you know there were all these sort of assumptions that uh, that just just didn't marry up and so as they were actually kind of providing funding for these uh, these pieces of work they could actually say is that you actually have to do this according to these assumptions uh, these kind of bits and pieces and what have you and so consequently is that uh, it's in a way kind of upskilling the uh, the consultancy uh, 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 people in terms of how to actually do a an adequate techno-economic assessment of a district of a heat network opportunity. So I, I think you know th there's all these kind of uh, mapping and uh, this that the next thing, but I think it's that standardisation of approach um, and and uh, uh, putting heat networks onto a uh, a level playing field, if you like with uh, the existing incumbent um, energy systems. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's something we really lack in the US, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, so why don't we open it up to questions in the audience for our esteemed panelists? Sure. Well, I didn't do that. That was in that was in Vancouver. That was in the Vancouver system, and I think they were they were uh, concerned at the outset that, of course, when you I, I think a ridge, uh, the full build out in Southeast False Creek is five to seven million square feet, and of course they started with half that or less than half that. So they were worried about you know what we face we uh, the upfront capital uh, costs, and if you tried to layer if you tried to get your re your regulated return on investment right from day one your rates would be, to, to this question, uh, way out of whack with the, with the uh, you know, conventional option. And I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't actually answer your question about you know, what, what, what's a range that our customers are finding acceptable as we go through this analysis. And I was thinking about that. I didn't actually answer it. Maybe 10% you know, either way around conventional, whatever their assumptions are, that becomes you know, anything more than a 10 or 20% premium. They start to view it as too expensive. So obviously, Southeast Falls Creek, decided to, um, they put in a reserve fund where they would simply uh, um, uh, pull from it later to make sure they uh, 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 levelize rates over, over a long period of time. In Markham, we viewed it quite differently. It wasn't in the rate structure, uh, it was on the ultimate return on investment on, on the asset. We made the, so we knew we couldn't offer rates that would be 50% premium from day one. Nobody would sign. We'd never get any traction going. 
We simply looked at it. We have a 25-year pro forma. We're assuming customer connection, and if they all happen, you know, we end up with this long-term return on investments that's acceptable. If it turned out, if it turned out that our customer connection rate did not, you know, our connect customer connections did not happen, and it was dramatically lower over 20 years compared to the capital investment, our return on investment would have gone from utility-style rates of 10 to 12 percent down to four, perhaps, or five. And the city viewed that as acceptable. And that's not what we want, but it would have been acceptable because some of the benefits that accrued from the economic development um, spin-offs of, of, the, of the district energy investment. So we didn't, we levelized rates, but it, it transformed into our return. That, that. Right, right, right. There's a different way of looking at the same problem. And I would say in Vancouver as well, um, it, it's a unique situation in that it's it's regulated. It's regulated kind of like a typical utility, but because it's municipal owned, um, the, the regulatory body is essentially the city council. So there um, there's kind of a, an existing regulatory framework where uh, there's a recognition that it's going to be a pretty long period of time before um, the you know recouping of those initial costs is going to be made, and that's okay. Um, they're ready to sort of make the make the rate structure work. And as Bruce mentioned, there's a, a reserve account essentially to help to help cover that. Yeah. Absolutely. The, whether you're signing a customer for a 20 or 25 year contract, it, you have to have a proper life cycle. They have to buy into what proper life cycle accounting of the energy to, to serve the building is. And that's the other thing we find interestingly about, interesting about building owners. I'm not sure this is answering your question. One of the observations we had is so f building owners have budgets, but they don't normally understand or get the life cycle correct about equipment replacement and equipment efficiency over time and so on. They, they deal with short-term budgets and they start adjusting um, and, and maybe under somebody else's watch. So uh, a lot of our district energy, it's interesting, a lot of our district energy sales process is educating building owners about their own situation. And it's, um, and, and some of the consultants don't like, some of the building consultants don't like that. Um, so a, it's, it's a it's a re, it's a real art. <laughs> it's a challenge to their professional integrity. You know? um, but I think the I mean one of the one of the questions that I think you brought up is is there a value to the sort of local economic development that is somehow being embedded in a you know a cost benefit analysis? Um, and I think I mean is there is there some sort of um, you know, qualitative. The, the local economic development benefit is specific uh, to the type of owner that we have, which is a municipality. One of the presentations I make quite often, if you take a look at the benefits of a district energy platform investment, um, we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in ours. There's the 
return on the company itself. There's the economic development, local benefits. There's the resiliency benefits, and there's the um, environmental benefits. So you got these four buckets, and the and what's interesting is a municipal investor is interested in all the buckets at the outset. The private investor is only interested in the first bucket, which is return on the investment, unless they're being paid to have an interest in these other ones. So for my, for my purpose, a municipal, a municipal uh, investor at the outset, is the, if they can, is the perfect investor because they're attracted to all the benefit buckets later, like the City of Toronto did, once the platform has matured um, and it, they've achieved some of these other benefits locally, economic development, environmental, and so on, that's when they can monetize it and sell to the, sell to the private the pension fund who now wants to see the next 40 years of return. It's, it's, it's really interesting. So that's it's basically being de risked for them. The municipality has the ability uh, as, the, as the lead investor and proponent of the project to de-risk it for the investor later. So I think we're being kicked off, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, um, so we're going to just make a slight change in the agenda. Lakshmi, do you want to let us know what the plan is? All right. Sure. So thank you to the panel. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs>